Hey everybody, I'm Silas, and welcome to Silas Cybology. Let's expand our mind. So after listening to my last episode again a couple days after I uploaded it, I realized that I sounded sort of down, which was shocking to me because I remember feeling really happy recording it. I'm going to try to be a bit more intentionally upbeat, because I really want to get across my excitement for this topic, and I also want all of you to be excited. On that note, please let me know what you think so far of this podcast. I've never made a podcast before, and definitely could learn from everyone listening. And real briefly, I also want to say that if you'd like to support the show, the best way to do that right now is to like, comment, share, follow, whatever it is you can do from the application you use to listen to this show. If you really, really want to support the show, rate and review the podcast in any place you can. It's free, it doesn't take much time, and it really does help spread this podcast to more and more people. I really appreciate it. Getting back to the podcast, for anyone new, this is a series where we talk about the research on psilocybin, the psychedelic prodrug found in magic mushrooms. We'll be going through and discussing the scientific literature, usually one study at a time, from past to present. I say usually one study at a time today, because this episode is actually going to be on three articles. The reason I chose to group these is because they were all written by the same two authors, Harita and Weber, and they are on the same topic the dephosphorylation of psilocybin into psilocin, although each brings slightly different bits of information to the table. We've talked a bit about psilocin before, but as a brief recap, after the administration of psilocybin, psilocybin is rapidly converted into the psychoactive drug psilocin. This episode is going to get into how this process works, so without any further delay, let's get into the articles. The first article we're talking about today is titled Dephosphorylation of Psilocybin to Psilocin by Alkaline Phosphatase, published in 1961. As some background, it's important to know a bit about the structure of psilocybin. There is a phosphate group off of the fourth position along the indole ring, which if you're looking at the podcast logo, that is the branch that's on the left-hand side of the molecule. The only difference between psilocybin and psilocin is that psilocin does not have this phosphate group present. Instead, it only has a hydroxyl group off of that same position on the indole ring. Now, the authors note that because this phosphate group exists on psilocybin, it's possible that psilocybin is a substrate for the alkaline phosphatase enzyme, meaning that alkaline phosphatase, a protein whose job it is to remove phosphate from organic compounds, might be responsible for converting psilocybin into psilocin. In this first study, the researchers sought to test whether or not this was the case by creating a homogenized solution containing calf intestinal phosphatase, psilocybin, and a buffer to maintain the pH of the solution at 9.2. Now, this is a basic environment in terms of biochemistry, and is about the level at which alkaline phosphatase works best. Later in this episode, we'll actually see what happens when you vary the pH, so stay tuned for that. Once the solution contained both the enzyme and psilocybin, They then removed tubes of the solution at varying times to see how much psilocybin and how much psilocin were present over time. They found that there was a rapid rate of dephosphorylation of psilocybin into psilocin within the initial 15 to 30 minutes, followed by a slower but still substantial linear rate of conversion over time. The researchers calculated that on average, about 5 times 10 to the negative 4 micromoles of psilocin was generated per unit of enzyme per hour, although the rate within the first 15 minutes specifically was about 30% faster than that average. The researchers also conducted the experiment using a constant amount of enzyme, 600 units to be exact, but with varied amounts of psilocybin. The goal here was to see if, after an hour, how increasing the concentration of psilocybin might increase the amount of psilocin that was liberated. Up until the concentration reached 4 micromoles of psilocybin, they found a linear increase in the formation of psilocin. Any more than this, and the amount of psilocin formed increased only gradually, appearing to approach a plateau as they got into higher and higher concentrations. This indicates that the enzyme was saturated after being provided with about 4 or 5 micromoles of psilocybin, meaning that all of the tiny enzymes hard at work were fully occupied with the psilocybin they had, and that they were at max capacity, so to speak. 
Now, this first study was very brief, so the last two points I want to make are actually important findings from other researchers that they note in their discussion section. The first is that magnesium is known to activate alkaline phosphatase, the enzyme we've been discussing. One study even found that in a solution comprised of 0.35% magnesium sulfate, also known as Epsom salt, the amount of psilocin produced increased by 30% compared to control solutions. This was super interesting to me, because I immediately began to wonder about an interesting experiment. And for the sake of liability, I am not suggesting anyone try this at home, merely hypothesizing about a potential experiment that came to mind. I would be interested to know if one might be able to increase the amount of psilocin liberated during a drug trip, thus getting a stronger trip from the same amount of psilocybin, by co-ingesting a small amount of Epsom salt perhaps a dose smaller than one would take to treat constipation, so that it doesn't cause any more stomach discomfort than is already present after taking psilocybin. The other finding that was important to bring up here is that the researchers referenced unpublished data that supposedly showed psilocybin to be over a hundred times as soluble in chloroform than was psilocybin. To provide some context, chloroform is an organic solvent, and this test is sometimes used to determine how likely drugs are to pass through what's called the blood-brain barrier. In order to have an effect on the brain, drugs need to be able to pass through this barrier. The more lipid-soluble the chemical, the greater its ability to pass this membrane. This test indicates that psilocin is much more likely to be able to exert its effects on the brain than psilocybin. On to study number two. This next article is titled The Enzymatic Dephosphorylation and Oxidation of psilocybin and psilocin by mammalian tissue homogenates, published in 1961. So the basic fundamental setup to this study is very similar to the one we just talked about. The researchers created solutions containing alkaline phosphatase and psilocybin and observed the amount of psilocin that was liberated. One key difference in this study is that the source of enzyme was intentionally varied to see if the tissue type used influenced the amount of psilocin formed. For some background, alkaline phosphatase is found in tissue throughout the body, but are found in particularly high concentrations in places such as the liver, kidneys, and intestines. Using rats, mice, guinea pigs, and rabbits as their tissue donors, the researchers examined tissue from the kidney, heart, brain, liver, and small intestine. Now the other key difference between this study and the previous one is that this study looks at how changes in pH influence the amount of psilocin liberated. This is important because although alkaline phosphatase performs best in basic conditions around a pH of 9, it is often of interest to see if a reaction also takes place at a pH of 7.4, because this is the pH that our blood is kept at, plus or minus 0.05. The first experiment, keeping things simple, just looked to see how much psilocybin was liberated over time in a homogenized solution of kidney tissue, psilocybin, a buffer, and potassium cyanide, aka KCN. I want to mention that KCN was included because the researchers noticed that without it, the psilocin that was liberated from psilocybin was then rapidly degraded by another enzyme present in the tissue samples that was sensitive to cyanide. They found that in the presence of KCN, psilocin was completely protected from degradation, and that this compound did not influence the alkaline phosphatase enzyme. What they found, just like in the prior study, was that dephosphorylation of psilocybin into psilocin was rapid within the first 15 minutes, such that about 90% of the total possible amount of psilocin was formed within that time frame. Keeping with the use of kidney tissue, the researchers then manipulated the pH of the solution. They found that, as we would expect, the enzyme performed best, as measured by how much psilocin was liberated, when the pH was at about 9. They also found, however, that the enzyme still worked albeit to a lesser extent, at a pH of 7.4. Around this pH, it produced about 15% less psilocin compared to when the solution was maintained at a pH of 9. On the flip side, they also saw a precipitous drop in enzyme activity when the pH was increased. At a pH of 10, for example, the enzyme produced a bit over 30% less psilocin than when at a pH of 9. So before we move on to look at differences by tissue type, There's actually one other experiment the researchers conducted in this study. As I imagine some of you who are listening might be aware of, there's an interesting phenomenon where a blue color can be found 
on psychedelic mushrooms. The researchers of the study noted that when KCN wasn't added to the solution, which is what we mentioned earlier protected psilocin from degradation, the homogenate samples containing the tissue in psilocybin turned dark blue within a matter of minutes. This blue color was tied to how much psilocin was degraded, and so when KCN was added, psilocin was protected and the blue color was no longer appearing. What the researchers of the study also figured out is that in addition to KCN blocking psilocin degradation, so did conducting the experiments in a nitrogen atmosphere. What does that mean? It means that the degradation of psilocin that is involved in producing this blue color might be dependent on the presence of oxygen, making this an aerobic, oxidative process. Now this is an incredibly interesting phenomenon, and is one that actually hasn't been entirely figured out yet. We'll come across some further research into this in an upcoming episode, but even still, more research might be needed to nail down precisely what's going on with this particular degradative pathway. Okay, so now, keeping the pH constant, the researchers manipulated the type of tissue and tissue donor used in the homogeneous solution. They also measured both how much psilocin was liberated from psilocybin, and in the absence of KCN, measured how much psilocin was degraded. So for rats and mice, over 99 and 95% of psilocin was liberated in kidney tissue samples, respectively. Only about 10 to 30% of psilocin was liberated in the heart, brain, and small intestinal tissue of rats and mice, and less than 5% was liberated in liver tissue. Comparatively, when using tissue from guinea pigs and rabbits, the greatest liberation was seen in small intestinal tissue, generating 88 and 96% of the possible amount of psilocin, respectively. This was followed by 65 and 34% liberation in the kidney of these two animal donors, with between 5 and 20% found in all other tissue samples. This indicates that, in all samples, the kidney had a large amount of phosphatase activity, and in the guinea pig and rabbit, so did the small intestine. Looking at the oxidative process, whereby psilocin is degraded, the results were actually much more consistent between the four animals. In each case, the greatest amount of degradation was seen in heart tissue, degrading about 60 to 70 percent, followed by kidney tissue, which was found to degrade 57 percent of psilocin in the rat and mouse, and about 30 to 40 percent of psilocin in the guinea pig and rabbit. Before moving on to the final study, I do want to reiterate that this degradation we've just been talking about is not the same pathway that involves monoamine oxidase. As we have discussed a bit in prior episodes, after psilocybin is dephosphorylated into psilocin, psilocin is then metabolized in our body by monoamine oxidase in the liver. I legitimately have no idea whether this blue color producing oxidative reaction occurs in vivo or not. Although wouldn't that be cool to find out that a bit of the psilocin in our body during a trip eventually departs through our heart, leaving us a likely transient but brilliant blue stain where it once was. Alas, the final article for today's episode. This one is titled Dephosphorylation of Psilocybin in the Intact Mouse, published in 1962. An important precursor to this study that Horita and Weber reference from the study we actually just talked about is that they found that psilocybin was successfully dephosphorylated into psilocin at a pH of 7.4, which is also sometimes referred to as physiological pH. Given that, they wanted to then examine how this process looked in vivo, meaning in a live animal, as opposed to in a test tube, which would be in vitro. To do this, the researchers took 48 male albino mice and injected them with either 100 mg of psilocybin or 72 mg of psilocin per kilogram of body weight, which represents equal molar doses, meaning that both doses contain the same moles, 0.35 millimoles to be exact, of the respective drugs. Then, four mice were killed off, two that had been given psilocybin and two given psilocin, every five minutes for a period of 30 minutes, so they could measure the amount of psilocin present in the kidneys, liver, and the brain. Two mice were killed per drug so that they could obtain an average value, as opposed to relying on the results of just one sample, 
which could leave room for an outlier to create substantial bias in the results. Now, if you did the math, you might be wondering why then 48 mice instead of 24. That's because they also manipulated whether the mice were given sodium beta glycerophosphate, or GP for short, five minutes before the drug of interest. GP was given because it's a phosphatase inhibitor, so theoretically, it would mean less psilocybin would be converted into psilocin. Starting with the mice given 100 mg per kilogram of psilocybin, the highest concentration of psilocin was found in the kidney, followed by the liver, and then the brain, at all time points assessed. They found that peak levels in the kidney and liver were reached in about 10 minutes, after which the concentration of psilocin declined gradually, although more rapidly so in the kidney than in the liver. In the brain, peak concentration was reached in about 20 minutes, so a 10 minute delay, and also appeared to reach a plateau, although I'm sure it would have also declined had they ran the study for more than 30 minutes. These overall trends were similar, whether or not they were pretreated with GP, except that the overall concentration of psilocin was lower across the board, indicating that it did in fact inhibit some of the dephosphorylation. It also appeared to shift the peak concentrations by about 5 to 10 minutes. Now let's look at the mice that were given 72 mg per kilogram of psilocin, which would be bypassing the need for psilocybin to be dephosphorylated. As we might expect, peak concentrations in the kidney and liver were found after just 5 minutes and declined gradually over time. In the brain, however, peak levels of psilocin were found after about 25 minutes. Higher amounts were still found in the kidney, followed by the liver, and then the brain. The other major difference here was that treatment with GP did not appear to produce significant differences in concentration, which makes sense if there is no longer a need for dephosphorylation. Well, there we go. Those are the three studies for today's episode. I feel like this was really a crash course on how psilocybin is converted into psilocin, which we now know involves alkaline phosphatase, and that this largely seems to occur in the kidney and intestines, depending on the animal. We also finally started to give credit where credit was due, and acknowledged evidence that psilocin is much more readily able to pass the blood-brain barrier than psilocybin. And we even got to talk briefly about the blue color that results from psilocin being oxidized. As always, I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you have any questions, feedback, or ideas for the show, please let me know. What did you think about having multiple articles in a single episode? Do you like when these episodes are longer, or would you prefer they're kept short? Let me know. You can find out all of the ways to reach me on the website, silasibology.org, where you can also find the full transcript for each episode if interested. Thank you all for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.